Hello, everybody, and welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. And I'm Lee White. And I'm Will Terry. And all three of us are professional illustrators, and we've been working for the last 25 years. And we've worked with just about every major public publisher in the business. We've also, between us, published about 50 books, and we've all taught illustration at universities. Yep. Each week, we're going to tackle a different subject related to illustration from three perspectives. I'm going to be right. Jake and Will are going to be wrong. <laughs> but every time, you're going to learn something new. <laughs> you I practice disagree. that. <laughs> <laughs> I concur. I'm right. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. So today, when Will told me uh, the idea that he wanted to talk about today, I was like, yes, because this comes up so often. And it's such a, it's such a, um, you know, at first I didn't know how to deal with this, the situation, but now I've gotten, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at it, but I want to just announce the topic. And that is actually, I don't, I don't have it written. Down. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect. Okay. Okay. Here it is. <laughs> Wait, that's, you just did the equivalent of back to the future, Dr. Emmett, the, you know what this means? You know what this means? It means that this thing doesn't work. You, you. Yeah, that's right. I just did that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The 10 reasons I won't illustrate your children's book. All right. There we so go. So that is it. This is, this is Will's show. So you throw out these 10 reasons. I'm going to take it away. Let me, Lee and I are going to respond. And let me start out by saying that... I one of my fears in doing this topic is that we will somehow be perceived as arrogant or, you know, uh, privileged in some way that we were calloused. And we, I, I want everyone to know that every single time I get an email where someone's asked me to illustrate their book, I kind of do a, a mental pinch myself moment because it, it really is cool to be wanted, right? I mean, I mean, and that's how I look at it is like, oh, here's somebody that's got a, uh, a project that they, that they love and, you know, and they thought of me or they thought of you or they thought of Lee or, you know, um, and in the illustration community, this is something that when we get together, it gets talked about a lot is just how many people are out there that have written a book. You know, it's, I think it's said that everybody has a book in them. Right. And, you know, a lot of people just basically don't know what to do once they've, they, you know, maybe this is a story they've told their children, they've told their grandchildren, and they're like, you know, maybe they've told someone else and someone says, that should be a book. I've One of the common things that I hear a lot is, well, your book is way better than some of the books I've I've read that are in the store, you know, that you can buy. I We go to the library and and we check out books and and a lot of them just aren't that good. Yours is way better. And, and that's possible. Um, but at the end of the day, what would be the equivalent to asking an illustrator to illustrate your book in some ways would be like, you know, going into a, a you know, your neighbor's a doctor and you say, hey, I've got this thing I need you to cut off of me, you know, or something. <laughs> <laughs> and here's, here's how you're going to cut it. And here, I just need you to cut right here, you know, and, uh, so let's go through these because there really are um, the, in a lot of in a in a big way. I think this is hopefully this is just going to be looked at as like an an educational podcast for for those of you who might be in the situation where you have a story that you want someone to illustrate, or perhaps uh, you're an illustrator or an author and you've got a friend that's been asking you to illustrate their book, <laughs> and you can. <laughs> send them this podcast. And that's, I originally made a video for my YouTube channel that, that kind of covered this, but I left out some things and I thought it would be a good topic for us to kind of revisit. So I, I also separated out these, uh, these 10 items into basically two groups. And one is for joint submission to a publisher and the other one is for self-published. So, and usually when someone asks us to illustrate their book, they don't make that distinction. They don't say, Hey, I'm, this is my story that I'm hoping that 
you can illustrate, and then we will jointly submit this to a publisher. Or I want you to illustrate this, and then we will self-publish it. Those huge mm-hmm. details are usually left out. It's usually, mm-hmm. will you illustrate my book? And there's the questions that are unanswered could take days to figure out. But, you know, and so it's not a question that you can even answer yes or no mm-hmm. to without knowing all these other things. So anyway, we're going to just kind of go through these and I'm hoping to get some insight from you guys. And if you have any others that you think should make the list, then maybe there'll be 11, 12, 13 or something. The first one is a uh, bad protocol. So, and, and, and this is actually this, this, question, will you illustrate my children's book, is probably, from what I've heard, is the number one question that's asked or brought up at uh, illustrator conventions, author illustrator conventions like SCBWI, which stands Mm -hmm. for Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, um, which is the largest organization for uh, authors and illustrators in the world with chapters in almost every country. I actually have it. I'm going to insert a question here. I don't want to uh, derail you, but I haven't been to very many of those. I've never gone as like uh, an aspiring illustrator. I've just been invited as a professional illustrator to 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 share, you know, my experience and and my my ideas. But are they promoted or are they marketed as a way for artists and illust- or illustrators and writers to meet up and collaborate? Is that one of the mm. angles that it's I don't think they're of- I don't think they're marketed per se like that but it sure is uh I think implied because you just have both sides together in one room mm-hmm. at one time mm-hmm. you know so so for a writer especially an inexperienced one you could definitely see probably the wheels turn and they see all this like portfolio show mm-hmm. uh you know at those conventions and then they're like wow that looks perfect for my book and here's the person right here in front of me mm-hmm. um so it kind of invites that idea I don't think they ever set it up to where they say, hey, this is not the idea, which they probably should. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I think it's implied okay. indirectly. Yeah. And and so anyway, this is this is probably the biggest, and I've heard them talk about this, is the most asked question is, you know, an author will come to that convention and they'll say, well, here's my manuscript. I just don't know how to find an illustrator. How do I find an illustrator? And th- it's there that an editor or an art director from a publisher will in their talk, almost always in the opening statement, in the opening talk, the editor will discuss that and say, now at our house, we don't expect you to find an illustrator. We don't want you to find an illustrator. We find the illustrator. That's our job. And we pride ourselves in that. And you have to, to unpack that whole idea. You have to realize that a publisher is getting submissions from you know, thousands of illustrators around the world. And they they keep those submissions. They um, they have their, you know, their house list of illustrators that they've worked with in the past. They have access to websites where illustrators um, advertise. And they, one thing that they really pride themselves in is matching up the manuscript with the perfect illustrator. And they, and they see themselves as like that's one of their major roles is putting these two people together. And so when you jointly submit with another illustrator, the problems that it, that it brings are multiple. One, you're, you're saying we think that, that we are a perfect pair. You know, so when, when someone – so usually like for Lee, you, Lee, like you, you've bumped into people before, right, where – where someone said, oh, you illustrate children's books? I have a book. And they don't yeah. know, they haven't even looked at your style, right? <laughs> yeah, some have, some haven't. I mean, it's it's everything under the sun with that. Right. But I mean, like, it would be the same as saying, what would it be the same of saying is like, I know where you should go on vacation. I know what food you should eat. I know what medication yeah, just you kinda, should there's take. There's kind of blue sky in it without doing the actual yeah. proper research behind I that don't know anything statement. about you or any of your physical ailments, but you should take this medication because it right. worked for me. <laughs> or right? it's like, oh, you write music? Uh, will you write a song for you know this, <laughs> this, this project that I'm making or something like that? Right. Like, you don't yeah, know if perfect. they're a, and you don't a, even realize that they're, they're a, a punk rock bagpipe band. Exactly. A punk rock bagpipe <laughs> <laughs> That is actually the perfect way I would describe your art, Lee. 
It's like if <laughs> if if you illustrated punk rock bagpipes as Lee White's. Style. Well, that's what I listen to a lot when I'm <laughs> illustrating, so it comes through. So yeah, so that's the biggest problem is that you're, uh, you know, the reason that these two people have found each other is almost because they bumped into each other somehow, their neighbors or their acquaintances, but it wasn't, they didn't bump into each other because their styles matched up perfectly, the the writing style and the art style. So that's a huge reason why it's a no-no. And publishers, the other, another thing is that they don't want to love the manuscript and hate the art and say, and be in an awkward situation of saying, we want to buy the manuscript, but your friend that's illustrated this, yeah, we don't want them. And yeah. then it creates all kinds of problems, um, potential problems. And so the publisher, you have to under, also understand that publishers have more manuscripts and more art than they can ever publish. They, you know, they're in a good spot because they are sifting through you know, the best books and, and, mm-hmm. and the chances of you finding someone, finding an artist and creating a project that is just going to be perfect for them is just so slim that they will just dismiss it just because you did a joint submission. Now, yeah. having said that, <laughs> are there any exceptions to that rule? There are exceptions to the rule, but I should add one thing to what you're saying here. One other reason why you shouldn't do that, the bad protocol, is that there's a, other than the art and the manuscript, there's other reasons why publishers pair people together. And mm-hmm. that has to do with marketing considerations. Yep. And so yep. sometimes if it's a new illustrator, they might pair him with somebody who's a fairly established writer. You you rarely want two newbies on the same project. Right, right. So if it's a new author, they might hire somebody who's an experienced illustrator to carry that. And, and so if it's a, if it's an unknown author and an unknown illustrator, that's a huge question mark for a publisher and one that they probably won't, um, go for because the financial risk is too high. And so you just can't anticipate what kind of marketing concerns they are going to be up against with your book. Um, so just another, that's a great point. Um, yeah, there's so many things that are happening behind the scenes at these publishers in their meetings, and that marketing one is is mm-hmm. huge. Yeah, I was put on a book with a first-time author, and I had done four or five books, and that was the point was, let's put you with someone who has you know somewhat of an online following, who has done published published some books before, um, and it was a good mix. The book ended up doing really well. She wrote a great story. I. Killed it on the illustrations. Was that the, was <laughs> and, uh, that the snowplow? <laughs> yeah, snow snowplow. Snowplow. Yeah. Um, once you are an experienced author, if they if there is authors listening to this, um, then at that point you do start to have some clout and some say in who the illustrator is. Twice I've been picked um, out of a pool of illustrators that the publisher suggested. Uh, the author got to say who they like the best. And then, and that's how I got the nod for doing mm. that job. And oh, so you do cool. have a little more pull later, uh, but not as a, not as a, as a newbie. That's cool. Okay. So number two would be uh, industry perception. And so if, you know, if someone like one of us or, you know, any illustrator who has done multiple books through a publisher, you know, let's say an illustrator has done two or three books and then they work with a do a joint submission. It will look weird to the editors, you know, like why? Since you've already been doing this professional work, why are you now doing this weird thing of the of the joint submission? You know, mm-hmm. and and so I put that on the list because it's like you need to understand that like you're asking, you're asking it'd be the well maybe not the equivalent, but it'd be like asking a doctor to violate the the Hippocratic oath by working on you at home without, I don't know, with, you know, in some sort of violation, even though we don't have a Hippocratic oath for (laughs) illustrators, maybe we should (laughs) do no harm. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm sorry, but this illustration is hurting me. (laughs) You violated the Hippocratic Oath of Artists, and we will, re- we will, we will uh, take away your, your artistic license. Uh, it is weird, though, but I mean, like, you do have to keep, like, perception is everything in, in business. And yeah. No, uh, 
that that's important. Uh, and even you know, my agent has said Kickstarters, even though they can make a ton of money and you could do really well at them, they're still in the publishing world can be seen as uh, you know amateur, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, well, why are you working in publishing and then doing these Kickstarters on the side, right? You know what? You know how does that pan out for your entire career? And they look at they look at book sales. And they look at the sales numbers of those previous books as to how much they're going to give you an advance on future books. And sometimes a Kickstarter thrown in there can can mix things up with that as well. And I, I do think that part of the industry is in its infancy. Um, it's just like a couple of years back. I mean, not even too long ago, say maybe eight or nine years ago, if you did digital work, that was kind of frowned upon Oh, yeah. Just because it was, yeah. it wasn't familiar with everybody, and the, the publishing industry moves very slow. Yeah, and so technology changes faster than the publishing industry accepts it. Accepts it. Now, if you do digital, nobody cares. I mean, it's just a kind of a foregone conclusion. It's probably more the norm than not. But right. back then, it was a bad thing, and and that permeated fine art and everything. Like you kind of couldn't work digitally as a pro right. for, for quite a while. Now it's accepted. And this yeah. is the same thing. I think Kickstarter and the, some of these self-generated pro- projects are going to, um, as they get a little bit more firm standing, will start to be seen as legit later. But yeah. we're not yeah. there yet. Well, there, no, I know of some projects which started out as Kickstarters and now are you know, fully published books from a publisher. Uh, and so Kickstarter in some cases were like the testing ground for this product to like yeah. proving ground, I guess, they, to show they call, that it, they call it proof of concept. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So I, I think the industry, the publishing industry is cognizant and aware of that. And you have younger and younger people who are not younger and younger, but every year there's new people coming into the publishing industry as older people retire who have a better perception of what Kickstarter is and what digital art is and, and all those kind of, you know, how much, it used to be that social media didn't even register for these guys. And now, you know, if you have a larger social media following, that could make the difference in thousands of dollars on your advance, you know? Mm. Yep. All okay. right. All right. Back to your list. Okay. So next, um, well, before I go, let me just, I think it, I should probably interject at least one book that broke the mold. <laughs> and that would be the Frankenstein book which is a parody of, of the Madeline, the old Madeline book by mm. uh, Nate Hale and Rick Walton, the late Rick Walton. Okay. And th- now, the the exception there is that they were both uh, decorated uh, author-illustrator, you know, and uh, very well known in the, in the business. And so when they worked on it, they brought so much expertise to the table that it actually created a bidding war over their book and they had three different publishers trying to buy that book. Well, that's different. That's not exact. That's not at all what you're saying. Like that's two pros saying, Hey, let's collaborate on a book together. Right. It's not right. It's two friends that are like taking all of the things we've talked about thus far into consideration. Like would my art style match up? How would you do that? You know, they, they really worked on it. I want to, I want an example of two amateur non-professionals teaming up and their book getting published and selling well. Do you have any examples of well, those? Well, I'm not a, I can't work miracles for you, Jake. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you an example of two pros getting ready to collaborate on a project and ending very poorly. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'll go through that um, at the end of this list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So number three, uh, I don't know you. So, uh, when I get a, approached by a publisher to illustrate a book and they say, um, here's the story written by so-and-so, I know that they've already vetted that author. I know mm-hmm. that they they love their manuscript. And I also know that they have gone back and forth with the author um, sometimes, you know, a dozen times before they've ever contacted me. Mm-hmm. That that manuscript is rocking and rolling and ready to go. And... When you contact me, I don't have any clue who you are and how committed you are to going through the rewrite process because, you know, and, and you know, this goes back to the education thing. A lot of people don't know. It's not like you write a story and you send it in 
and they, you know, the clouds part and the editor just starts weeping that they've read the best story ever. And then they give you money and then they, they hire an illustrator and the illustrator illustrates it. I, I don't know of any manuscripts that have not gone through lots of rewriting. And, and do you guys know, I mean, like you had any examples where they've just published it straight up? No, no, no. no. It's okay. always gone through even maybe a year of. Right. Of, uh, and, and, and that's a little iteration. known secret that a lot of people don't know is that, you know, sometimes you'll get notes back as an author on your story and like, and they'll, they'll say, uh, you know, we really like how this is going. We're concerned about these particular parts and it might be plot. It might be um, dialogue. It, there, there might be a number of, of things, you know, the, the manuscript that I'm working on, the author didn't know about some of the, I have to be a little cryptic cause I don't, I, I'm not really at liberty to talk about this, but didn't know some of the physical facts about the subject mm-hmm. and had to do some rewriting because factually there was some inc- inconsistencies. Um, and so when you're faced with fixing a story and they don't always tell you how to fix it, they say, we love it, but it's got these problems. Then you have to go back to the drawing board or the writing board and, you know, and you have to start figuring out how to fix this. And if you don't see the problem yourself, it can create this huge task for you that you don't really know what to do. And, you know, you might take it to your writing group, but not knowing you, I don't know if you're, if you're, you know, strapped in and ready to go for the long haul. So I start to illustrate this book and then we joint submit and then you get, if they even like it, you know, which is very rare because of the the, the number of, of manuscripts that are sent in. But if they are interested and then they come back with changes, I am not confident that you, A, know how to change it and that you're willing to go through those changes. So that's another reason why. Sorry, I can't illustrate your book, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who you are. <laughs> uh, okay, I I can't disagree with that. Okay. Onward. Okay, so number four, award submissions. So another rarely known thing is that publishers actually submit their books at their own cost upwards of 200 awards. There are, every state has at least one award. Some states have, you know, three or four awards. Um, there's, you know, the, the most famous award is the Caldecott. Um, but there's, you know, the, the Dr. Seuss award, the Theodore Geisel book. There's the Coretta Scott King award. There's just tons of awards. And in order to submit for that, the publisher has to basically take 200 books and mail them to the right people at the right times and fill out all the paperwork. And it is a huge task. And that's a huge reason why a lot of books do well is because they win some of these state awards. They win some of these other awards and that gives the book more um, publicity. Librarians find the book. They recommend the book. Another another thing that we could just b- briefly brush on is that you really want librarians to recommend your book so that it goes out, so that your book goes to people's houses and it gets stepped on and it gets dropped and the binding falls apart. And then the library is like, well, this is a really popular book. We have to reorder <laughs> this book. And so a lot of your sales comes come from libraries. And the, if the librarians don't know about your book, then they can't recommend your book. They can't buy your book. And so these mm-hmm. awards are a huge part of, you could say, of the marketing. Um, and if you were to, I guess that one actually, that one should probably go under self-publishing. Uh, but it's, it's, it is a reason that I would not, one more reason why I would not work with, with an individual. Uh, who's, Have you guys won any awards, big awards with your books? I've won, I think I've won like five or six state awards. Yeah, I've won, I've won a state award once. It helps. Uh, I, yeah. I, I almost I won, won an ALA the, award last year. Which one? 
I won an ALA award, like when they announced the Caldecotts and stuff. Oh, yeah. I had a, one book that was grouped with the Caldecott and the Newberry. Nice. That was the, the Priya Bulpri Award, which is for Latin. It was for the author, so mm-hmm. I didn't actually get any credit. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it was for this novel that I illustrated uh, called I Lived on Butterfly Hill, and it made a huge difference. I mean, it was worldwide sales at, after that point. Yeah, it's huge. I had a friend who won the Governor's Choice Award for – Arizona, where they they buy your book for every fifth grader, oh. and I almost I was told that I was like runner up on that. I didn't get it. I was I was picked by Dolly Parton for her reading program. Yeah, at it was crazy because all of a sudden I started getting all these emails from literally around the world. Hey, I love this book. It's called Ducks Don't Wear Socks, a children's book. <laughs> I was like, why are all these people all of a sudden emailing me about this book that I published like over a year ago? <laughs> And uh, it turns out just like overnight, it was part of Dolly Parton's reading program that's international. (laughs) And like 30,000 copies went out in one day. Oh, my gosh. Wow. It was crazy. (laughs) So not necessarily an award, but these are kind of things that Will's talking about that your self-published book won't be a part of. Right. Yep. Yeah. I had another, speaking of that too, and this is, I guess, tangential, but um, they, or I don't know if that's the right word, actually. It's related. (laughs) <laughs> to what you guys are saying. Uh, I had, uh, uh, in Kansas, I went to do a book signing and the Boys and Girls Club had bought a thousand copies of the book. And so I went and signed a thousand copies wow. and they distributed them to uh, a bunch of low-income, kids at low-income schools. And they all got a free free copy of the book that was all paid for by by the state. And so that was something that was, specifically set up because the publisher had inroads with the right people at that state to do this thing. And they were saying, we need a book to give out to these students. And my publisher was like, we've got a book right here for it. You know? So that was a huge advantage to having me have gone to a publisher with that instead of, you know, kickstarting it or self publishing or something like that. The publishers are connected. That, that kind of leads me to number five, which is reviews. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, the publishers have relationship with uh, all these review organizations like, you know, the School Library Journal, uh, Kirkus and Publishers Weekly, and uh, and I'm sure there's more um, where, you know, your, your book gets reviewed. And that's huge, too, because the librarians are reading those um, reviews. And if your book doesn't get reviewed, it's really not on the radar, mm-hmm. you know, so... That's and that that would also go under the self publishing list, um, is is uh, you know and now that doesn't mean that someone who wants to self publish doesn't have all these bases covered, you know it is possible, but I would I would venture to guess that ninety nine percent of them don't haven't thought of all these things. Um, yeah. It's it's more of a of, of a whim. You know, I wrote this this children's book and. I want you to illustrate it, but they really aren't thinking along these lines. So that number five reviews would be a huge one for me. Making sure that your book gets reviewed. Uh, Number six is opportunity cost. And so, you know, Lee, if you get asked to illustrate a book and you accept that, you know, a self-published book, what are you turning down? What aren't you going to do? This is the this is the the biggest one for me. Like I can I know you could be successful uh, on all those other levels, like submitting it and self publishing and, and doing whatever. But but me saying yes to your grandma's like story bedtime story time turned into a children's book means I'm saying no to maybe working with this really celebrated author or maybe working with this publisher that I've always wanted to finally get a book published with, you know, and instead I'm doing this project, which it could take me months to do all the illustrations for and what have, you know, and what will I have at the end besides whatever money that that person's paying me, you know, you know, if this book ends up selling 500 copies and is a huge self-published success, that's, that's, you know, thousands less than, than what could happen at a at a publisher. How, how long do you think it takes the average illustrator to illustrate a book? A thirty two hmm. standard thirty two. I'd say six months is average. Average. And, yeah. And we're faster. 
<laughs> all three of us. I know, I know how long it takes you guys. Like Jake is like, it takes me like three days or something like that. Two, <laughs> two days. You have it down to two now. How uh, long, how no. long does it take you? Three months. But three months. Okay. And it takes yeah. me about a month. Yeah. And you're, you guys are extremely fast. Um, for me, the fastest that I ever did one from the, the, all the sketches to the finish was probably two months. And I felt like that's all I did for six days a week. I didn't have a life. Mm. Yeah. Um, so really, it would have been like four or five months if it was spaced out into eight hour days, you know, 40 mm-hmm. hours a week. But I think can- that's fair. I'll, I'll revise my answer to, to that. <laughs> I didn't include all the sketches and stuff like that. It's just for finished art is one month. Yeah. And, and I've done one in one month uh, when I was working like crazy. And I never, at, when I was doing it, I was like, never again. I don't want to, you know, I'm going to, I'm not going to procrastinate. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to. Get going on well, this. Let me thing. add, as, as we move forward, so we're going to move from joint submissions into self-publishing. I want to add one more thing to the joint submission Yeah, that I can speak to with a lot of experience now. And that is if you do want to forge this path and you say, no, 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 I, I accept all those things that, that, you, that we just listed and I'm still going to do it. I will still want to do it. The last thing I want to add to that is write a contract that's very specific on what you own as an illustrator and what you own as the author speaking to both people now, assuming that there's two people involved um, and what you expect out of it and go in with your eyes wide open. Because what happened to me was I teamed up with a very well-known writer and I had an idea for a book and I brought this writer on. I said, Hey, would you like to write this story with me? My understanding of that was we're going to co-write this book but we didn't spell that out. <laughs> so assumptions are very, very and, bad. Things and the idea for the book, just to be clear, was yours. Absolutely. 100% documented there. There, So there's no question about that. And then you, Luckily. you bring this author on so that you can, because you want to make sure that it's written better than you could. That- yeah. I, I, I struggle with the actual words. I understand what the story is. I understand what happens in the story, but I thought to myself, I can maybe advance this. I don't have enough of a ego or a need to own everything myself. I thought maybe, you know, am I, am I hindering myself by mm-hmm. struggling with the words? Maybe I can advance this project quicker and, uh, and give it an extra spark too. I like working with people. That's why I work with you guys. Um, mm-hmm. I'd rather work with people than on my own. Uh, so I, so I brought this person on very, very well-known writer. And, uh, so my interpretation was we're going to co-write this thing and I'll illustrate it. But we, I didn't write that down. I just it was just I it was just assumed on my part. Her assumption was that she's now the writer and owns the content, mm, wow. and I'm just kind of a wrist. I'm kind of illustrating the story, but it's kind of her story now. Well, needless to say, this had a a breakup that was not pretty because she thought one thing, and I can understand why she thought it. We never talked about it. It was I'm, I'm not saying that she was even wrong. It was just not mm-hmm. clarified. It wasn't specified in the beginning. And so if you're going to do any kind of joint venture, I don't care if it's with another illustrator or if it's a uh, – even critique groups now I would be nervous with. Like when you guys give feedback at a critique group, I want to know that uh, it's still my story. That Just because you suggested something and I took the advice. That's interesting. Doesn't mean that you now own the story. I never or, thought or that about part that. Of it. But after your experience, I can see. Like, yeah. Can we just if say you, that there are weird the people out there? Okay. <laughs> there are weird people and we're not weird. Like, I would say with, with the critique group, definitely know who you're getting involved with. But it would be good just to have – uh, not you don't. I, I wouldn't say you have to have a written agreement, but maybe like oh an heck email. yes, you do. No, not, no, no. You not need like a, a written agreement. Not like a signed <laughs> contract with a lawyer. Yes, you do. Not for I would critique never group. Be part of a critique group. You have to understand. Lee that is is uh, damaged goods now. I know. I know it's good, but but the good thing is everybody in the critique group side. It, it doesn't have to be like some crazy thing. It just can be can say that as we offer feedback. The original content creator owns I'm, I'm all gonna, of their I, choice. This is one of those rare occasions where I think I'm going to side with Lee on this. You guys are all making right. drafting uh, <laughs> contracts for critique groups now. That's There's what you guys no are doing. There's no way I would enter a critique I, group, pitch a story, and not have um, just this understanding. Because here's the problem is that, again, some people – what if somebody comes up within the critique group, some total rewrite of your story – 
you rewrite it. You're like, oh, that's a great idea. You come back the next week and they're like, yeah, that's mine. <laughs> I mean, it's, I can see because that. here's the thing. There's ideas are like, not what? copyrightable. Ideas are not copyrightable. That means if you come up with right. a story and you mm-hmm. pitch it at the critique group, I could literally come back the next week with that same story. Look, we're all weird in different ways. I know, I know. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> just protect yourself. I guess my thing is is know who you're getting into a critique group with, and if there's someone you don't trust, yeah, have a have a. Yeah, thing. but I did. I did trust this person, it's, and I did know. Her. It's hard to envision the level of crazy because you're not that kind of crazy. You're crazy mm. in a different way. So you can envision your crazy, but you can't envision right. other people's crazy, and that's why the contract is there. Because just and it, pro- it protects them too. By the way, it's not just it's not just yours. This is, maybe this is like Aliens little among Jake, us. little Jake not wanting to face life. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob's, little Jake's going to end up in little court. <laughs> little Jake's growing up a little bit today. <laughs> uh, it's a this, it's a sad commentary on. The human condition. So, but. I haven't, I haven't done a contract with you guys yet. We share our ideas all the time. Yeah, we have an operating agreement. I've got an this operating cool, agreement um, for SVS, idea but not called, for- uh, Little Bot and Robin. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's about a robot and a, a little bird, but it's a Robin. <laughs> okay, what about a little bot or a big bot and a little Robin? Big bot. <laughs> <laughs> Little I, Big Bot and Crow <laughs> is this cool story. And the and the and the Big Bot eats crow. Well, here, well, here's the actual thing: is the reason that project stalled out for uh, several years was because someone published a book called Little uh, Robot and Bluebird. No uh, way. Yeah, and I had I was like I had submitted it to publishers. And one day, like a student of mine at, at BYU was like, hey, there's this book. And I looked at it. It was published a year earlier in England. Oh, no. And I showed it to my agent. And she's like, oh, oh, Jake, I'm sorry. And I was like, well, this guy totally like copied my comic story for this book. And she's like, yeah, but you don't want to. What are you going to sue him for? Like, I'm sure, you know, how much money has this book made? It's going to be a lot of expense. You know, you're going to get publishers involved, all this stuff. She's like, just let it breathe a little bit and we can do yours later when this this book has sort of had its space. And so that's what we ended up doing. Wow. No one's ever like, it's funny because no one's ever brought up that book again. I don't, I don't know. If you really think back in your memory, that guy was part of your critique group. In college. (laughs) 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 Ah, dang it. Okay, we're getting off track. Anyway, just just be careful and go in with your eyes open. Um, You know, each of you can take that to what it means to you. For me, it means a full-on ironclad signed contract. (laughs) You know that the side anecdotal stories are actually what I enjoy the best about doing this, right? Lee's critique group, actually, (laughs) he doesn't actually meet with other people everybody's lawyers meet and they share their (laughs) ideas and then you get feedback from the lawyers on on that's 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 what's going on there it's all vague no details are said either (laughs) right all right i'm gonna i'm gonna knock us back on track here okay so number seven we're going under the self-published category now even though a few of those other ones really kind of fit under there professional production so you're in general, you're not an editor, art director, graphic designer, production coordinator, or printer, or probably have the knowledge to know how to set up a book, uh, to know things like page counts, uh, pagination, just all the, boy, there's so much that goes into it. And so in self-publishing, you kind of have to be be overconfident in thinking that you can, you know, forge ahead without these skills. And most... Mm-hmm. I would think most people that are going down the self-published route either aren't thinking about these or don't have the means, the money to hire this out to get it done right. And so you're talking about making a book that's supposed to compete with all the other books out there. And really, I think most people that want to self-publish are probably underestimating how good published books really are. Mm -hmm. This is my number one reason why I wouldn't do a project with somebody is the, is that 
the author, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to probably catch some, some scrapping from some authors, but <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the number one thing is that, yeah, you've written a nice manuscript, but how the author typically approaches the illustrator in these kind of ventures is I'm now the art director. Oh. And they don't have the skills to be the art director. Right. I can tell you a funny story. When I, right when I was leaving Art Center, I agreed to do this self-published book. And it was my, I didn't, we didn't have these great lectures for some reason at Art Center about should we do self-publishing or not. I just thought, okay, cool, I'm going to get a book. Right. And um, I was picked out of a lot of people supposedly. And, and so my ego was like in it. I was happy to do it. And it was just kind of Alice in Wonderlandy story. And I remember submitting the first sketches and there was this cow character that was in the, but it was an anthropomorphized cow. So humanistic qualities. And, and uh, I showed the author and she's like, my mom would never wear that because the cow's wearing some kind of clothes. And she said, my mom would never wear that. And I'm like, what? Oh, no. And she said, well, that cow is based on my mom. And oh, it got, no. it was just, the whole thing got crazy because there was all this backstory that I didn't know. And, but, but yeah, and she was just trying to drive this story and for things that made no difference to the story. Like it didn't matter if the right, cow looked like right. her mom or not. Which is um, the job and, of the editor to say, yeah. guess what? No one freaking cares about your mom. <laughs> yeah, these little the subtle things, things of why you wrote a character. Right. Yeah. So I ran as fast as I could out of there. Luckily, I only had done a couple of sketches for it. But I saw mm -hmm. the writing on the wall for sure that – the whole thing is going to be like this. There's all these subtle things. And she knows, you know, an, an author can't picture a scene the way that an illustrator can. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, Will's really good with the perspective. Jake's good at perspective. And I am too. And and so, like, we, I, I don't do a lot of three-point shots or, or worm's eye view shots, but I do consider them. And, and mm -hmm. if they're going to make the story better, that's what I think of. An author does not have that visual vocabulary to be able to think of all these scenes and, and different angles and things like that because they just mm -hmm. don't have the training. Um, so they so should not be your art director. They should not be an art director <laughs> at all. And then getting into, into production coordinator and, and how to print and all this kind of other stuff is a whole secondary. Oh thing. man. And when you, is huge. when you see uh, a lot of Kickstarter books, a lot of self-published books, you, it's the little things that most people aren't going to notice. Like the margins are weird. You know, they're, they're, they're extremely small or extremely big. <laughs> They just don't feel like a regular or the book. font. There's just the yeah. font is just off. Yeah. These these are all considerations that graphic designers, you know, basically went to school to learn how to do. And, you know, what's funny to me is when someone approaches you in the email, it's it's a short email and it and it's basically, Will you illustrate my book? I love your work. And that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there is no mention of here's how here's my business proposal. Here's here's who's going to print it. I vetted the printer. Here's who's right. going to design it. Here's who's going to edit it. Here's who's, you know, here's who's going to art direct you. Uh, just you know, none of that is ever thought of. So that's why that is number seven. Yep. Number eight uh, is a simple one: is royalties. Uh, you know, basically, we as illustrators we work. Uh, for royalties, we try to get royalties as, as, as often as possible because in creating a story, you know, creating the, the idea for the story and creating the art for the story where a lot of the idea is nurtured and manicured in the, the art, we are you're, the author and illustrator creating intellectual property, which could have a long life. It could go into being made into comics. It could be made into um, – uh, cartoons. It could be made into a movie. Um, it could be, there, there's all kinds of marketing that could go in with this. And, uh, and so one of the reasons that we want to get royalties is because usually the advance, the amount of money that you're paid up front is not enough to sustain you in a long career if that's all you were getting. Um, and, if the project goes on to make uh, multi becomes a multi million dollar project, the creators of the IP should go along for the ride. Should be making some of that, right? And so, you know, I'll, I'll most people that want to do self publish, they just want to pay, pay a flat fee, 
And most illustrators that are, have established themselves just really aren't that interested in just working piecemeal work. We, we're really in it to throw a lot of mud on the wall to hope that some of it actually sticks and, and, and generates royalties to sustain us long term. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's that's my dream. And I would assume that's your you guys as well. That's true. And when, once you see an example of somebody whose royalties worked out well, <laughs> I'm not a good example of that. <laughs> I've, had, I've had mediocre royalty success. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But um, David Hone in particular has had one book that every Christmas comes back and just I mean, it's it's at the front of the Amazon bestseller list every Christmas. Which one is that? And has been for 10 years. It's called God Gave Us Christmas. Oh. It's about this bear in Christmas. Um, and it's just a sweet story. Uh, but, man, it – one time I made the mistake of you – know, I had gotten a royalty check. I think it was for $13. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was complaining about it. And I was like, man – things are terrible. He's like, yeah, I just got one too. And I'm like, oh, man, what was yours? You know, we were, I was looking for, for, uh, you know, misery loves company. Uh-huh. And he tells me his four figure royalty payment <laughs> that he gets every year. And, uh, I was, I was quite shocked. Sometimes it goes into a five figure amount just on royalties. This is after that's, he's already been paid for the project. Right. I just, I, I could not believe it. I mean, it's a, it's a, like a secondary free income yeah. that he gets mm-hmm. every year from this thing. And then I'm like, oh, royalties actually work Yeah, <laughs> my, for some people. And then there are those um, like Brett Helquist who have funded their kids' retirements and their own retirements and uh, with a series of unfortunate events. So Right. That's right. So, yeah. So royalties, um, it's, it's, it's not that an individual couldn't pay them. It's that uh, – I mean, there's a trust issue. Like, yeah, how are you going to track the sales? How are you track I mean, it? I mean, like publishers, they now, the bigger publishers have a portal where you can log in and actually see your sales anytime yeah. during the year. And you can see, you know, your next check, what it's going to be. And so there's that. Um, number nine, distribution. And basically it's like, you know, if you're going to self-publish and you're going to get, you know, a couple thousand books delivered to your house, what are you going to do with them? You, this is a huge how, issue. This is one I'm just learning the hard way. Yeah. How how are you going to move those? Where are you going to sell them? Did you do you know about? Uh, did you know and think about getting an ISBN number on the book so that you can sell it in stores? How are you going to get stories to take it? A lot of stores won't take a self published book. You know, like Barnes and Noble will, will not carry them. So it's not like you can't imagine if you've never done this before. You can't imagine the scale of one of these books, uh, both literally and figuratively, like they, when I got the email from, they were shipping my book, um, after it had been published, they were shipping the book to me (laughs) and the shipping weight was 2,500 pounds. And I'm like, that was the first time that the scale of it hit me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That I'm going to have literally a ton of books. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm looking at my garage going, Oh no. Your run from Kickstarter and my run from Kickstarter and Jake's, those aren't even big book runs. No. no 2,000 books. 2,000 no. books. And I, I got 3,000 books from my Antler Boy book. That was probably the, the most I've gotten in one time. They were hardback, so they are thick. And it, it took up my basement. One of the rooms in my basement was books. <laughs> I have it a storage was, unit for mine now. Yeah, yeah same here. That's... Yeah, my I'm garage. running out of house for my books. <laughs> I'm just starting to get some of my garage back as we go through the those little books, you know. Um, nice. That's actually uh, Jeff Smith. when He was self-publishing Bone, the Bone comic book in the 90s. And it was doing really well. And But he just had so much, so many, so much stock of the book that he actually bought the house next door to be the storage unit for all of the comics. <laughs> Wow. And now the house's equity has made more than the books ever did. So. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not a distributor and you don't have relationships with distributors. So no. I should add, now that we've gone through royalties and distribution, a, a part of those two equations and the last one that Will's going to go into, which will be money in a second, mm-hmm. um, something that lines up with all three of those that doesn't happen with a self-published book is foreign rights. Um, and that's a big mm. one for the last three mm. books that I've done. They've gone into uh, Korean. They've gone into Chinese. They've gone into Japanese. Um, that's a really good point. 
That's number I, I 11. Even, I've never thought of that one before. Because I just got yeah. um, the little bot and sparrow in Chinese. Yeah. That was just it's delivered cool to, to me. to see that when it's yeah. all the different. Our list goes to 11. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so money, number 10, money. Uh, you probably just don't have enough. You probably don't understand. Like, like I know that uh, most people, and I... So I created that Spit video. Spit it out, Will. Just tell us. I created that. <laughs> I created this video on my YouTube channel to actually send to people. Uh-huh. And then I, I sent it out a few times and I felt like a jerk because people were like, you could have just said no. You know, like I, I didn't need <laughs> this long, huge list kind of a thing. But right. but me, you know, I, I want to know the answer to, to things like, oh, really? Why not? You know, I'm curious. Some people aren't. They just want to hear no. So I get mm. that. A lot of times when people ask, they're thinking, well, maybe he'll charge 500 bucks because they have no idea how much time it takes and how much money we make in a year, Mm -hmm. right? And, you know, either they or their spouse has a full-time job, often is the case. So their money is taken care of as far as their their household income. And this is a side project for them. So they're Mm -hmm. thinking... Well, maybe this is a side project for me, but this is my living. This is what I do every day. And so I would have to get, and I wanted to ask you guys this, like we're going to play a game here on like how much it would take. So let's say you guys have just gotten this email. Okay. And I guarantee you have a price, but Mm -hmm. we never, I never, I've always wanted to play this game with people like to say like how much I would really need just to, just so they would understand, but I don't because I don't want to be a jerk. But right now we can be that jerk, okay? So, so Jake and Lee, you read this manuscript that comes in an email, and it's it's terrible, it's really bad. And but the person says, and they never say this, by the way, but they say, "Oh, and by the way, like I'm loaded, and just name your price, okay?" <laughs> it would start the the starting figure would be fifty. Fifty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> now explain that because for, 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 and this is where I wanted to dive into. So Lee, you don't have to tell us this, it's, you know, but how much I, what we want to know in a perfect world is how much you would get from a publisher. Now you get all those other things we talked about in the list, the distribution, the reviews, right. the award submissions, the professional production, all that stuff. So that's if, worth if something. I'm getting, if I'm just getting a, an illustrator only gig from a publisher, I'm starting at 30k and and upward. Okay. And I'm so, a little bit lower than that. And Jake is a little higher. I'm right, than, I'm, uh, right I'm around about there. there. Right I've gotten there. more and I've gotten less and Right. Yeah, that's just kind of my my low mark and, and then it's and, good, that's, and it ranges from there. And that is the advance against the royalties. So for mm-hmm. let's just explain that really right. quickly. Publishers pay in advance. And so when you sign the contract, usually you get uh, half up front and half when you deliver the finals or a third and a third, a third. Like I know for my contracts with random house, I get a third up front when I sign the contract and I get a third after sketches and a third after finishes. And yeah. that money is called an advance. And that money um, has to be earned back through royalties. So in other words, I won't get any royalties until that amount is reached on what I would have gotten. And then I start getting royalties. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But so it would, they would have to take in. So, so the reason the 50 K is higher than what you might ask yourself, why is it not 30 K for the self publisher? And that is because the opportunity cost that Will was talking about earlier and mm-hmm. the difficulty in uh, a possible royalty situation. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to be uh, accounted for those two things. The hassle mm-hmm. of doing this is going to stop me from working with a traditional publisher and more so it's going to stop me from writing my own, which is a much, much better and lucrative right. um, deal right. than just being mm-hmm. an illustrator. On what the about so, the fact that you're going to hate it? Cause it's horrible. That's the, that would, that would be the line in the sand. I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I don't think no, you would do it. This is if 50. you like the book. This is if you like, if the I like the book, it yeah. would be this one. If I didn't like the book, it would, there would almost be, it would probably be into the, uh, <laughs> at least mid six figures. Cause we know <laughs> there's a number. I would do it for five hundred. Let's this is like, let's say it's one that goes against your moral principles too. I have no principles. <laughs> <laughs> for that price, you have no principles, <laughs> and you have to eat a raw 
cockroach. <laughs> Everybody has a price, but it's it would be up there to where I'm sure all three of us can agree it would have it would basically give you a nice retirement. Yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't have to do another project. It's you know, and we're and this is where I say this this conversation could be misconstrued as like you know three really arrogant jerks that are just you know having fun. But just illustrate Grandma's book for Pete's sake. You know, <laughs> spend a weekend and illustrate it. <laughs> it here's here's the thing though, Will. Part of this is the publishing world's fault because they will publish some crappy books Mm -hmm. and the artwork will be super simple and some will be like, well, it's just marker on a piece of paper. I mean, you look at Don't Let the Pigeon Ride the Bus, right? Right. Hugely successful. And the art is, you know, five steps above, you know, a fifth grader. I I might... I might correct you just a little bit. He can ride the bus. He just can't drive it. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever. Anyways, so you see that and you think, well, yeah, my, my fifth grader could probably draw a pigeon just like this. In fact, my fifth grader did. So, right. you know, let's hire an illustrator and maybe get a little professional edge to it, right? And, and in some cases, maybe an illustrator might – be like, oh, you want really simple illustrations? I can knock that out in a weekend, and you got your book done for you. But uh, a lot of times, it, you know, it's something that they want some detailed illustrations. They want something, you know, really nice, watercolor or whatever. Um, uh, that that does take time. But sometimes yeah. it might be something super simple. And and if it's you know if it's a family friend, and I owe them for something that they've already done for me. You know, I might take this job and and not charge them a ton and, and do it, but uh, it really has to be a special circumstance, you know. I'm not going to be doing like a 32-page, highly detailed, illustrated thing, though. Yeah. You know that I pride myself in disagreeing with you guys, and this is one of those where I think illustrating a book for a friend or family member is one of the worst reasons to take on a project. I'm with you there. I would never work for family. And the reason is for me is like, ask me to come over and I will help you move to the third floor of a apartment building. I will, you can have my time, you know, like I will, uh, dry. I hate drywalling. I'll drywall. I'll paint. I'll help you with anything, but creating art is, Unless, unless I love the story. So I would, I would illustrate a friend or family's book if the story was amazing and it was like the best story I've ever written or ever read. Mm -hmm. And I, all of a sudden I I just see myself drawing these amazing images and it, but it would be selfish. It would, I, I really do feel like art needs to be selfish. I feel like we. What if your kid's elementary school needs a really cool t-shirt designed? I'll do it. We do that. That's a like not even in, com- in the same ballpark of commitments, though. Okay, so somewhere in between illustrating a book and designing a T-shirt is you're like, no way, I won't do it. That's right. <laughs> Something. In- <laughs> but well, we should talk about if you are going to do it because again, like like you guys said, I think some people will hear this and say, well, good for you guys, you don't have to do it. But here I am, I don't have a publishing deal, right? And I've got this opportunity. So there's a couple criteria that I'd like to throw out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One, like Jake just mentioned, you should love the project. It, mm-hmm. sh- it should be something that you would do anyway. Yep. Some kind of, in, in terms of style, in terms of content and all that. So make sure that it's that. It's not just something that you're going to be like agonizing over because you don't really do creating, content. And let me interrupt you for a second. But for me, creating artwork or trying to create artwork with an assignment that you hate I would rather be doing any, I'd rather be, you know, having my eyeball scraped, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> it really is hard. I mean, you think it's like, oh, you know, we, it doesn't matter. We can just draw whatever we want anyway. No. But mm-hmm. I, agree, I agree with you. It's there's, it's like, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me oh man, it's to do something that you don't like. So make sure that you really like it. And then when you set up your agreement, cause you are going to set up an agreement with a contract, I'm assuming all of you are nodding your heads saying, mm-hmm. of course, <laughs> make sure that the author or the person who's writing it doesn't own the entire project, doesn't own your work. Right. Um, and then if they're going to lowball you in terms of pay, which they are going to do that, even though it probably won't work out later, go ahead and set up a, a royalty because royalty and advance work together. 
And that's a real important concept. Even when you go from working from a self-published person to a traditional publisher, if a traditional publisher doesn't have much money, that's when I start licking my chops and looking at that royalty payout. Yeah. Um, so like they, if instead of 30,000, they have only 5,000, well now I want 50% of the royalty, yep. <laughs> <laughs> some kind of huge amount. And so those two go hand in hand and it's important to understand that, um, you know, low advance, high royalty or high advance, you can lower that royalty, but you should definitely own the work. Don't give away your work. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the, the last thing that I kind of wanted to end with here is after I turned down these people, and, 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 you know, say, Hey, it was really flattering. Thank you so much for asking me, but I'm really busy with my work and yada, yada, yada. They will email me back and they'll say, well, can you recommend someone? And again, that goes back to, I don't know you. I don't know what you like. I don't know. I really, you know, don't know your manuscript, but you, but I'm going to recommend an illustrator that out of all the different styles out there, you should use this person because they're available or because they're the best stuff. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make any sense. Um, and I just thought I'd throw that in there, even though I know that I will still get this question. I, I get asked to illustrate someone's book. I want to say almost every day. It's amazing. Now of all three of us are, we've put ourselves out there online and we, you know, we do YouTube things and we do a lot of social media stuff and a lot of school visits and a lot of, so we're easy to find, but I, I know that when I talk to other illustrators, they're getting asked a lot too. And, uh, so anyway, this is, it was an interesting topic to kind of go over. And it is, I've got a new technique on answering that question. Will. what's that? This was huge. I, 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 I think it was from the book. There was one book that me and Jake were both listening to. Um, not the one thing, but one of those productivity books, and something they said in that was really stuck with me. And that is, if you get an email, it doesn't mean you have to answer it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh my God, that was so freeing. And so now when people <laughs> send me that, and I get a lot of them too, I just don't respond. And I feel a little bit guilty every time. But then I also kind of smile and love the feeling that I don't have to type that out. <laughs> so for what it's worth, anyway. So if you, if you write me to do it, I'm not going to respond. <laughs> what if, let me ask you this. What if you're a kid in high school, you have aspirations to be an illustrator, you are working like a minimum wage job at Sonic, you know, your, your fry cook. This is me actually <laughs> when I was 16. <laughs> um, and then someone's like, Hey, I, you know, your mom told me that you love illustrating. I've got this children's book idea. I'll pay you a hundred dollars per illustration to do this. Like, that would be something I would totally say yes to yeah. as a 16 year old. As would I have. I would say yes to. And there's, there's a great um, thing you guys need to listen to now. It's the, uh, the graduation commencement that um, Neil Gaiman oh gave. My gosh. Have you guys seen so that? Good. Hmm. He gave a great analogy. It's been a while. I, I forgot about it. It's so good. But one of the things he says is that he, he views as, and I'm going to kind of probably mutilate how he said it so elegantly, but mm-hmm. he views his like career and his, his goals as this mountain in the distance. And as long as he's moving towards the mountain, mm-hmm. he's doing the right thing. And so mm-hmm. with the example that you gave, Jake, you know, you're working a, uh, a minimum wage, you know, throwaway job. And all of a sudden you got the, this gig that actually turns you towards the mountain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you start moving towards it. Whereas that same offer for us three right now would be us turning away from the mountain right. because our goals Great are point. so different at this point. Right. Yeah. Um, so go listen to that if you haven't heard it because it's, it's fantastic. It's overwhelming. His the repeated phrase in there is make great art. And mm-hmm. I think it's, it's obvious, but at the same time, it is the solution. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yeah. And really, in that same thing he says, another another thing he says that I always remember is rarely has doing something for just the money worked out right? Mm-hmm. in some way, which goes back to us saying you have to love the project and you have to love what you're doing. Yeah. And that's why. And I, I don't. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that's why you guys would turn down a, a, a book you didn't like for 50 or 60 or $70,000 or 80 or right. nine, I mean, just it's not, you You only have so much life, you know, and, and mm-hmm. the, the, the three of us are kind of somewhere in the midpoint. So we're kind of starting down the backside. I'm probably speaking for myself more than you guys, but yet like you I know, mean, I might I might think differently about this once I turn thirty. 
<laughs> yeah. But I, I think it's not a, a binary option. There's a slider here. And, you know, maybe you're in college and you could use some money and someone's willing to pay you a couple thousand dollars to illustrate grandma's children's book. You know, that might be, that might be a thing you take on. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, 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 I think it goes to, I think it goes to what, what are your needs? You know, does it point you towards your right direction or not? And um, I don't want to just flat out say, don't ever do this. The other thing too, it's like part of it is, I mean, going back to doing something for family or for a friend, or if I knew that even if I did a couple of illustrations that could really alter the trajectory of their writing career and just get people to look at their stuff that they wouldn't have looked at before, I might, that would be a factor that would make me want to say yes to it, even though if I wasn't getting paid a ton, right. but I, I yeah. owed something to this person or felt like I could really help this person. I might, I might do something like that, but it's, you know, it's random person off the street who, you know, oh, you're in my neighborhood or you're in my grandma's neighborhood. And I heard, you know, you do this kind of thing. It, you know, you really have to kind of take all of that with, you know, weigh all the options there. I figured out why working on art that you hate is worse than digging a ditch or, you know, some sort of hard labor mm-hmm. task. And it's because you, your mind can't escape it. Like mm-hmm. when you're digging a ditch, you could be, you could be miles away. You could be on the beach somewhere. Yeah. In your but head. When you are forced to work on a bad idea, you are there. You're present. What if they're <laughs> like, I, I will pay you to do this book And I will fly you to the Bahamas (laughs) and rent out a hotel. So you have like a week or a month where you could just work on this the whole time. (laughs) Actually, Will, you didn't say your your price point. You you leaned in on us, but you didn't. Yeah, at some point, what's funny is at some point, the money would, you would, at some point you would get to a point where you'd say, okay, I can do this. I can do X, Y, and Z with this money. I've watched you take on a job that you did not want to do because the money was good. Yeah. And the whole time you're hating it. Oh, yeah. I can't say which one it was because so, it's disrespectful no, you can't. to the client. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. And it paid amazingly well. The last one that I did that with was like two or three years ago. And it came in handy to get those checks. But, <laughs> and it was an insane amount of money for the amount of work that it was. But it was horrible working on it. And yeah. so, yeah, I would have to be. I don't even like entertaining that idea. So that's not a fun thought. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's kind of a deal with the devil yeah, in a way. It it's really how it is. feels. Well, let me ask you this then. I know we're like way over the yeah, yeah, plan, yeah. but looking back on that job. Uh-huh. Would I do it again? Would, like if you had the DeLorean time machine and you could visit yourself and be like, hey, Will, I just want to tell you. Do take the job or don't take the job. What would you say? At that point, I needed the money. Mm-hmm. So I'd probably do it again at that point. Today? Even looking back now, do you think you could have told yourself, hey, if you did X, Y, and Z, and not like invest in these stocks, but like... <laughs> oh, oh, if I did, took on other things? Yeah, like, hey, what if you did this instead? This would... Mm, I'd have to know what that was. I think it had to mm-hmm. be pretty concrete. These are fun right, games we're to play. Too, we're getting too off track. We're getting <laughs> I'm too sorry. This is my, this are, are, we're losing our viewers here. <laughs> anyway. Let's wrap it up. I, I hope people aren't watching this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they're not viewers. They're listeners. Oh, that's true. I this is These are the reasons why I'm not going <laughs> to illustrate your book, but I still like you, and I still am flattered, and I still think that you're awesome, and I really hope that you will uh, get some more education on – and and submit that book to a publisher and figure out how to, how to satisfy your itch to become an author. And, and that might include self-publishing. It might include finding an illustrator. You know, one suggestion, a lot of people ask me, where, where should I go hunting down? And some people are smart. They'll, they'll say, well, I know you're really advanced in your career, blah, blah, blah. So could you recommend somebody, you know, or where to look for an illustrator, you know, and if you've got 500 or a thousand dollars, you, you just don't have enough money. You know, if you, if you've got a little bit more than that, maybe you go to a, a college and, and ask, you know, some, some people that are really looking to, you know, illustration students that are looking to make a mark. Um, but, you know, any, any illustrator that's kind of working in the field is 
unless they live in another country where cost of living is really low, they're probably not going to be able to do it for a few thousand dollars, you know. And just to give you, maybe just to throw this out there really quick, uh, a starting advance is anywhere from five to $10,000 for a brand new illustrator with a publisher, a small to mm-hmm. medium sized publisher, mm-hmm. the five to 10 grand range. 10 yeah. to 20 is kind of a bigger publisher starting out, and then it's up from there. So, plus royalties. Yeah. Plus the whole marketing engine of that. Um, publisher and their all their distribution all the good, connections all the goodies, and all the perks. editing, yep. all that stuff. Take, all right, let's take wrap us this out, up. Jake. Okay, thank you everybody for uh, listening to this podcast. I, I learned some things here. Jake, little Jake grew up a little bit. <laughs> I'm drafting Frank up some Jake. contracts right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry. You can find him at willterry.com and uh, follow him on Instagram at willterryart on Instagram and check out his, his videos on YouTube. Just do a, a YouTube search for Will Terry. A lot of good content there. Lee White can be found at leewhiteillustration.com and check him out on Instagram at leewhiteillo. Posted some great stuff on there. And I'm Jake Parker. You can find me at mrjakeparker.com on Instagram. I am at jakeparker. And uh, I'm also on YouTube. You could search out some of my videos on YouTube as well. So if you like this episode, please share it around. Uh, tweet it out. Mention it on an Instagram. Call your friend on the actual phone and just say, hey, listen to this episode or listen to another episode. We'd love it if you subscribed on iTunes. That way you never miss um, when one of our episodes drop. Uh, and if you're on there, just leave a review. We would appreciate that. We want to know what you think of this episode and other people want to know what you think of this particular podcast. Um, If you're wanting to join in on this particular discussion, we have a forum on svslearn.com where you can log in and um, post about your thoughts on this episode uh, in its own thread. So chime in over there and let me know your thoughts. And thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. All right. Uh, All right. This is episode seven. Boom. Can you believe that? We're getting into this Star Wars sound. We are ready to launch, I think. You know what's funny is like we're loving doing this and nobody has heard a single episode. We may never (laughs) release it. These these might be the unreleased tapes of SBS that are like besides down in the basement. We'll put them in a dusty corner in a box. Tanner's listened to two of them now. He's done the show notes for them. Uh Uh-huh. And he's like, you know, and he's a podcast. He listens to podcasts all the time. And I was like, so how's it, how's it compare? He's like, dude, this is, I love it. Like, this is the best. So, oh, good. so there's that. That's awesome. So, I mean, he's a little biased, but He is still. way biased. <laughs> we need to, we, he's also <laughs> like, you have to give him a plus five on niceness, like overly niceness. Oh, my gosh. So then you have to subtract two points from his review for that. <laughs> <laughs> you know he's going to be editing this episode, right? <laughs> hey, there's a lot worse things to be called than nice. <laughs> that nice guy. He's such a nice guy. Oh, so nice. <laughs>